Good, welcome back everybody. It's now 12.49 on my clock, so we'll we'll kick off. Um, so we now move to the performance section um, and we start with the performance report, which has, I know, been through Modern Healthcare and the Quality Committee. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, Merrick and Jane if they've got anything they want to say with regard to the performance report before James uh, leads us through any highlights. So, Jane, do you want to kick off? Um, thank you. I mean, um, I think the thing we particularly focused on, which I'm sure James will will pull out, is is around um, the outpatients uh, activity uh, and the endoscopy. Um, so that was an area, particularly from a quality patient experience point of view, that we did focus on at the committee, and then we did receive a level of assurance that there was key, key focus, and, and importantly, the divisions are also very cited on this and including it in their risk registers. So that was uh, really one of our key focuses. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, Merrick? Um, basically, the key thing which has arisen really more than since those reports is the enormous work around the um, the elective uh, turnaround, and although we have delays in uh, an endoscopy and points as, as has been already said, as we look into the current time, we are starting to see real fruits born out of all of that activity, and really quite a stellar performance in terms of starting to make inroads into backlogs. I mean, there are still substantive backlogs, but at the same time, substantive inroads. Okay, thank you very much, Merrick. Um, so, with that lead in, James, you're on. That's really helpful. That's a very helpful lead in. Thank you. Um, I'll start with urgent care. Just sort of pull out a couple of bits. The performance is in the paper, but the so we can see what the performance is and the trend there. I would just draw attention to the fact of how busy the department has been and how busy our urgent care inflow into the organisation has been. We can see June, July, September, and October have been the busiest months on record at St Peter's. That's busier than a winter, any winter ever, actually. They're the, some of the busiest attendances that we've had. Uh, so it's it's been a busy time and it continues to be so. So our performance and what we've achieved needs to be set in that context. We've also, you can see in the paper that despite the the challenge that we have around the volumes, we are performing comparatively well and it's important to recognize that otherwise it's a, a kind of a two-dimensional um, view of performance that it is challenged and we would like to see some of our patients faster but actually against the national average we're pulling away in terms of national averages dipping down and, and we are not and in and, uh, in the south of england we're performing well nationally we're performing well it's a challenge across uh, the scene um, it has been mentioned um, a couple of times in the meeting, so I just need to draw attention to the report around ambulance delays. So we did experience some ambulance delays, which is unusual uh, for us. We we experienced um, 280 patients between three and 60 weeks, uh, three and 60 minutes, 30 and 60 minutes, and 50 patients over 60 minutes. Now. We, we've been doing a lot of work um, to try and avoid that, and that is a peak for us. So it's not something that normally happens here. It, it's, an, it's a reflection of the volume that of attendances that we're having in the organisation. It's a reflection of the peaks. So we have surges, and it's those surges where we're, we are um, experiencing or have experienced some challenge. But it's also the whole system is under pressure. And as we sort of talk through the paper, it's, it's the output of the organ. It's how we discharge patients out, certainly to the more complex uh, settings. Those patients with more complex needs, uh, well, all of our patients actually, it's that discharge piece as well, because um, people who are waiting are waiting for care, often for admission, and we need to discharge patients, and we are at that level sometimes. Um, and that's that has been partially uh, a partial reason due to those ambulance delays. It's multifactorial. And as it say, it's been discussed in performance committee, sorry, the modern healthcare committee and the quality of care committee. So it's well rehearsed, but it's something that is in the report. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, diagnostics. In this, in October, um, we reported a position of just under 90% compliance to the six week standard. And there are there are two drivers for this, really. One is our non-obstetric ultrasound. Um, 
this has given us a weight of 585 patients who are over um, six weeks. Now, this is a, this is something that we hadn't had a problem with previously. It's driven by a vacancy factor that we've been unable to fill. It's been driven by sickness and it's been by a, a demand growth of 12% um, over recent months. Now, we've done a number of things you'll see in the plan around rectifying this around recovery. We've changed the consultant session. We're looking at bank house. We've got agency, but actually the bigger things that we need is around um, some external support because of the volumes that we need to recover here. And the local, the regional picture and national picture is the same, that this, that these areas are under pressure in a number of organisations. So um, Sasha in a similar position to us. The region is looking to do a piece of work um, with all of us across Surrey Heartlands to see if there's any help. There might be outside of Surrey Heartlands uh, um, an organisation that's got some capacity, but it is a joint problem. It's a problem that is common to at least one other uh, organisation out of the three of us in Surrey Heartlands. So it, it's something that we're working on and we're looking for independent sector as well as system support to um, conclude that. In terms of endoscopy, um, we've had to revise our trajectory due to, um, due to predominantly staffing challenges clerical staffing challenges in the main that drove an issue in terms of our reporting and that has seen our number of patients that were on our list and that has seen that that jump in October to 343. We think that that will rise again because of the way that these patients that the, were being put on the list they fall between two months so it will rise again in November. However it is a positive news story around um, endoscopy. We have um, an endoscopy manager uh, who's experienced, who's joined us now, but we're waiting for that appointment. We have made some additions to our leadership team. We have got a real grip in terms of daily performance, a performance dashboard in terms of the workforce and the booking metrics. And we also have um, from the Alliance, uh, the Cancer Alliance, KSS, um, Cancer of Sussex Alliance, we have a team who we invited to come in and work with us who support around endoscopy. Now they've been supporting around Sussex particularly. We've invited them to come and work with us on our recovery plan to provide more of a grip and assurance. They've done that and they have provided nothing but positive assurance so far on our plans, our grip and our progress. So that's a positive piece and we'll be bringing forward the, we're bringing the trajectory to the board um, around uh, the plans for how we'll get back at the timeline for getting back to six weeks, we'll bring that in due course. Um, recovery overall and Merrick very helpfully outlined that we have had um, some really good, really comprehensive plans and some really, really solid work from our management teams and our clinical teams together around how we get on top of some of our backlogs. We've got a very comprehensive outsourcing program and insourcing program. We've been hampered by the fact that we've been down one theatre and we continue to be down one theatre. So the that's due to the fire that we reported a number of months ago. So you can see despite that challenge, we are still making some good inroads. So when we get that theatre online, um, that will really help. Now we're looking to go into the winter with um, a green ring fence at Ashford, so that should help us even further into that, um, picking up uh, the backlog that we created during COVID. But you can see here that the, the methodology has changed the clock stop reporting and under clock stop reporting we've put a really lot of effort in now. Actually it doesn't matter what methodology you would see improvement at this point but it's certainly coming through on the current one of, of clock stops. I, I don't think there's anything else. I mean, just cancer we have had an issue with 31 day subsequent treatment and the TWR. However you know we are experiencing significant increases in demand here. 10 to 30 percent across some tuber groups in, in terms of um, demand post COVID. Um, so we are working on that. The rest of the, the standards are compliant for this quarter, this uh, month uh, and will be for the quarter. There's a lot in there, Andy, and I, I feel that I know we've, we've I just want people to sort of be able to have some time for questions because I've stopped there. There's a lot in this report. It's a lot of messages this time. Exactly. And, and I know it's been given a thorough looking at and committees as well so uh, that's, yeah. that's very helpful. So questions for James. Marcin. Thank you Chairman. <clears throat> uh, James thank you for this report as you know I think this is an excellent first class, best class this transparent report. Uh, but 
floor to get insurance on, but also for our community to see how hard you're working. And I just think again, a huge thank you for all your team's efforts in terms of what you're doing so well. <clears throat> Although it's sustained, difficult, and lot, okay, lots going on in activity. I mean, across the board, the metrics and the trends are all in the positive direction. So well done. My question to you, and I should have picked this up in Modern Health, and I apologize for not doing that. Could you explain um, when we talk about um, uh, overnight stays and breaches in A&E versus the chart on occupancy and flow? We used to talk about the reason why we don't get flow is all our beds are full. But mm -hmm. so your chart showing we're not actually over 100% on occupancy. So could you just explain to me that process and and why we still is and we don't have flow when we're not full? Yeah. Or maybe full and I missed the chart. Thank no. you. I'm just trying to get to that that particular page, Martin, but um the i mean i know the it's issues that you're referring, yeah i'm on okay I, so the issues are that in your so firstly thank you for your um feedback about the report that's really appreciated and i'll pass that to team thank you very much in terms of your question you're absolutely right now the the issue is the overnight weights in dta uh, the overnight weights dtas in a and e versus bed occupancy yeah the We've gone back to the region about this because we think that the metrics, so we report here, the metrics are reported externally, so the board recognise anything that they might see in other forums. However, there's there's quite a lot of ambiguity around the way that this this create this target is captured. It includes other beds that um, that we would never expect to fully utilise. So we have now in a post COVID world ring fenced green beds that will not be broken that we do not put other patients in for the protection of all of our patients and the safety of all the patients that is not taken into account in this metric so we have a ring fenced little ward of nine beds at st peter's now if that's running at you know six or seven patients that that would we wouldn't use that we wouldn't be able to use that as the way things stand we have a, a ring fenced hospital at ashford you know we need some movement in there so we have we are we've gone back and there is constant dialogue at the moment um, and i've been involved with meetings with my team and feedback from their meetings externally that we don't think there's there's potentially a question around um, some of the beds we closed due to social distancing there's still a question around should they be included or not included in the numbers these things are unhelpful um, because it doesn't portray on a day-to-day -day basis, what we are managing through bed meetings, for example. So I, today we, we've got, you know, we as any day, we we manage every day, four or five times a day, we come together and look at how many beds are available when moving through. We never have this level of um, occupancy in our organisation through the day in terms of where the beds are. So it, it's a disparity. It's just partly to do with the measuring um, and what they include, social distancing, and partly because it also includes beds that you wouldn't use for non-elective flow, which is more pertinent now in a post-COVID world or pre-COVID COVID world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcin. Um, David? Well, it was, it was just it was asking a question from, from Marcin's question, because we've had that debate about the occupancy all the time, haven't we, James? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an old one. And, and I think what you're saying, which I think we all agree with, it, it's a very bad measure. It doesn't really help us. So, so we should cross it off the the paper then, because it's not helpful. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to do that. It's it is a metric that we report externally, so that's one of the reasons why it comes to the board. I, I, and we we have to do that. But I, but I see that um, same measure. The southeast to get it right, I guess, isn't it? Well, I I see the same metric uh, on the regional, the MD regional thing, which goes round. Yeah. And um, and again it reports something like 85% bed occupancy when when everyone's falling over so again it's not a it's not a very good measure anywhere is it so i just wonder what i just wonder because we've had that we've had this debate about it for a while so it might be worthwhile just parking in a corner somewhere you know, yeah maybe we just annotate it david you know it's 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 required for external scrutiny and, yeah. and but we focus on a, perhaps a more a more pertinent one that 
uh, yeah. think James can uh, think about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're absolutely right, David. It it, it doesn't it doesn't even fit with the rest of the paper, does it? <laughs> as, as as Martin's described as well. So you know. So I, I the two answers are I think we should sort of consider whether we bring it or whether we discuss it. But the the point is we are in discussions, active discussions around how we can make the accuracy of this better for us and for the system. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Thank you for that. In which case we will move on and uh, hopefully we'll get through this. Suzanne's got a hand up. Um, oh, she? oh, right. OK, sorry, I missed that. Suzanne. You're muted, Suzanne. I was only really going to ask James if he thinks everybody measures it the same way. Um, or, do, or do you think there, there are, I'm trying to think of the right words, means of measuring this differently? I think there are interpretations that we're seeking clarity on and seeking consistency. OK, on, yeah. OK, I think that's reasonable because I'm looking at today's system performance and we've got trusts, some local ones to us reporting 99.4% occupancy. Um, which is interesting, isn't it? Because all the things you refer to, which I think are quite right, by the way, James, you would take out of our bed base ring fence beds, social distance beds. There's always a debate about what you do with the escalation beds, actually, because uh, I'd really like to report that we were 115 percent occupancy, which is probably where we are most days. That that would that would cheer me up. Um, so I do wonder. So I think you've answered my question, but it's, it's, it's maybe worth us sort of maybe maybe Andy, there's a question that you and I can raise on like one of Anne Eden's meetings just to say, you know, we've been looking at the performance across the system and we're just curious about yes. this number. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's the interpretations have to be clear, haven't they? You know, yes. that's the thing that what, well, what it shouldn't, do you there shouldn't be an interpretation, should there? You know, no, it's it a definition. Be what, this is what you include and this yeah. is what you don't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. I'm glad I raised this. <laughs> well done, Marty. You, you you pick out the things that we, Davidson, like we said, we've been we have been having this conversation for a long time because it's always yeah, upstairs has decided how they want to report it. And there'll be reasons, there'll be politics around that. You don't sure. want all the hospitals looked to foot full to the gannels. Uh, right. I, I possibly wouldn't be quoted on that. No, this is an open meeting. And then, um, <laughs> So oh, maybe um, I will be then. <laughs> let's uh, let's just move on then to thank you, James. Uh, thank very, you. And, we, and we do like your new uh, performance report. I think it's uh, you know once you're used to it, it's actually very helpful. Thank you. Um, so let's not dwell on these, but uh, anything uh, that anybody wants to bring up. So modern healthcare minutes, Merrick. Um, really, Simon, uh, actually, Simon, are you going to cover it in more detail? No, you're not. OK, so um, putting aside performance, the thing I just want to touch on clearly is funding and funding uh, for the first half of the year was uh, secured. For the second half of the year at the time of these minutes was looking uncertain in terms of how the emergency recovery fund would work and sharing of pressures across uh, our patch, our system. Um, we now understand uh, stopwatch, stop clocks. Well, I think we're starting to understand the, the NEDs anyway, um, and how that will feed into funding. I think, Simon, correct me if I'm wrong, whilst we, we're at, not out of the woods, the, the, rest, the second half of this year is not looking financially as, as risky as it might have done in this context. But of course, all the risk is now into next year where the hospital with its much higher, as we've touched on already, staffing levels, which is along with other operational changes, including uh, changes on how appointments are made, a whole raft of things is driving the performance, that's driving the waiting list down. That has a cost implication. It is substantive, and that cost implication flows into next year. And at the moment, none of us know really where the funding will be next year. It is a very real and present funding danger that we are all acutely aware of and focused on. I think that's what I would say, Andy. Yeah, OK, thank you. Simon? I would uh, just tweak uh, Merrick's statement a little bit. Our risk is still significant uh, in the current half, but they've changed. So they're all around the elective recovery 
fund and the activity levels associated with that. And, you know, the reality is, well, we're trying to sustain both emergency activity and elective activity at the same time, then we need a significant amount of extra funding, which is uncertain to a degree, um, you know, at the, at the moment, really. So we're watching it closely from month to month. And um, yeah, so the risks are different. I think that's just the, the subtlety there. OK, thank you, Simon. That's uh, helpful. OK, and in terms of reference, America, are there any changes? Just. You're muted, Mary. <laughs> Just tightening up really the definition of what makes us core it just gives us a little bit more flexibility. OK. So those will be for approval, I guess, terms of reference. So can we approve those terms of reference, please? Yep. OK, good. Thank you. Um, and then we have the open integrated digital committee minutes. Chris, um, I think we've covered a lot of those in terms of um, obviously sorry, safe care. Uh, and I guess the other thing to say, as you mentioned earlier, Suzanne mentioned her report. Uh, there's actually lots of other initiatives uh, actually being landed, Baginet, um and uh, dawn rheumatology. Uh, so, so you know, there's a, there is a really robust program and we've got new terms of reference in place uh, and that committee is going from strength to the steering group rather is, is actually developing well uh, in bringing all the subject matters experts together and getting prioritization around the, the program beyond the big transformational uh, Surrey Safe Care um, and, and also it really touches on Surrey Safe um, Care record and the importance of uh, data sharing uh, across the ICS, which is going to become increasingly more important. Um, and David touched on that as well today. So beyond that, I don't think I really want to say anything more unless anything, anybody's got anything else to say or any issues to raise. Thank you, Chris. Anybody? Simon? Just one, maybe. There's a lot of um, changes planned in the fourth quarter. Obviously, we're sorry, safe care, but Chris, um the pack system the pathology systems okay. so it's just a future risk that is coming up um on the radar for us in, in terms of the interaction of all of those as much as anything you know individually not a problem but if they all end up in the same fortnight then it will be yeah. majorly challenging and i think they're system-wide risks not just for ashford and st peter's um they obviously interact a good deal around our partners as well so just to watch out for those it's it's fresh off the uh yeah, off the agenda, that one. Yeah, thanks for cheering us up with those, Simon. Sorry, yeah. right. we'll do it, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Lots to do, I think, on the digital. Uh, but yeah. the, big, the big message is it's not all about Surrey Safe Care, although Surrey Safe Care is obviously <clears throat> consuming a huge amount of time and effort. Uh, at the moment. Really. OK, <clears throat> so the People Committee on the 24th of September actually Dammy was chairing that. I was the only other non-executive there for that one as it happened. So, Louise, could I ask you to uh, bring any highlights from that? Yeah, happy to. Um, two, uh, two of the governance papers that went to that, that meeting were then uh, followed up the following week at board. So you will be familiar with those medical revalidation reports and then the um, annual equality uh, report both came to board. So I won't go into any detail in, in relation to that. Um, we try to take uh, at each at each meeting, we take an item around the Workforce Transformation Programme. And um, in the September meeting, we had quite a long and you know, constructive conversation about, um, about the culture in the organisation, some of the feedback that we'd had from some of our teams and um, a sort of proposition around um, how we might uh, go about um, investing some some more time and energy in um in in the culture transformation piece um, so so not just with with particular departments although that clearly is a theme working and supporting them um in terms of team dynamics but also the piece around um our employee relations activity and how we manage people issues and have transformation in in relation to to that um, as well as um, uh, our uh, uh, ambitions around developing an inclusive culture and the work that, that we needed to put in place in order to deliver against those ambitions. So that was the piece around workforce transformation that we had, and then obviously the workforce report 
uh, is our standing item where we look at our bath risks and then um, the detail around workforce metrics and mitigation. So, so that's probably the highlights, Andy. You still on mute, Andy? Thank you. Thank you, Louise. And and obviously there was a people committee last week, but obviously the minutes for that aren't here yet. Um, so any any questions on those people committee minutes? OK. Um, so now we come to the strategic change, uh, just the annual report. Um, Chris Kane. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, having uh, sort of uh, got getting my feet onto the table, it seems a bit surreal presenting a report for a year when I wasn't around. But I hope you can take it as read. And we have tweaked the um, terms of reference slightly and that I felt that um, we need to get the balance more focused on a mixture of both assurance and forward looking. And Tom and I have been working on that in terms of there's literally so much change taking place and we've got this huge volume as today's meeting is evident of, of activity on the day to day stuff. How do we um, carve out some time just to figure out what's happening in the system, given all the big changes afront, afoot with ICS, et cetera, et cetera. So a little bit more environmental scanning, and we will deal with this in a bit more detail at the strategic change meeting this afternoon. But I don't think I can add anything more useful, Chair, um, but happy to take questions, which I'm going to field to Tom because he was there and I wasn't. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was very clear the changes, and I think I think needed as well. Uh, so we'll start with Tom. Oh, it was really just to um, to, to say that it, it, the the the, um, the annual report has been to the Strategic Change Committee, but that's not noted on the cover sheet. I just think it's important to okay report that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Chris. Kathleen. So I'm trying to come off mute. We've gone back on mute again. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, no, I thought it was good as well. My my only observation was that we need to be clear when we talk about collaborative that that relates to all the relationships with our, um, you know, with our collab with, with providers, other providers, other uh, partners, uh, because that isn't mentioned at all uh, in in the terms of reference. Yeah, and it I might. think that's a good that's a good point, and that. We may, we may need to sort of categorise all these various terms to for clarity. Yes, yes, that's what that would be an observation. OK, that's a good point. Thank you, Chris, for doing that. Um, I think take, the team will take that away. Anything else on strategic change? No, I think. No, I think that's fine, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and then we will move on to the regulatory section. Now, I understand that the Freedom to Speak Up Guardian annual report has not been through People Committee. Marcin, can you just confirm that it didn't go to People Committee last week? I think Louise is shaking her head as well. That is correct, sir. So we will not take that today. Um, I want that to be scrutinised by the People Committee before it comes to board. So apologies that that has appeared early. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but... Uh, uh, we won't debate that one today. So we then move on to the audit mm -hmm. committee. Minutes. So, uh, these minutes have not been approved. Our committee meeting is next week. However, um, because audit committee meets so irregularly, and um, we decided to bring them because of one kind of key issue, two key issues. One, you'll have already seen that we already brought the terms of reference to the last board meeting, which you approved, which we are implementing now. Um, <clears throat> the second one, obviously, is the accounts were finalized. They've been laid to Parliament. They've gone to the Council of Governors. So all of our formal processes for last year are now complete. The one issue that I just would raise <clears throat> forward looking is around risk management. Whilst we've done so exceptionally well on the BAF and implementing the BAF and having a risk management strategy, we are now in the case of needing to get it more embedded throughout the organization. Uh, Sal is having to do more work than our view of the committee is necessary. She's actually hand holding the divisions more than she needs to. 
Uh, and therefore, what we would like the tech to discuss is how we can actually make the Division C risk management as key to running their business rather than a bureaucratic extra. Very similar to how we discussed it yesterday for the ICB going forward. Um, risk isn't something you just do. It's not a task. It's not a checklist. It's part of seeing how you uh, discuss upwards and downwards through the organization. And we just wanted to feel that <clears throat> what Sal is being asked to do feels a little bit burdensome and is uh, not core to her role. And uh, we just feel that that therefore needs an action for, for tech to take forward. We have recommended a way for her to report to the committee on divisional and corporate risks that is less demanding of her time, which is what our role is, which is oversight, not deep dives. It's just a really reflection. We've done, we've moved the, you know, the parameters so far in this organization on risk. It's now just that final push for the organization to see it as vital to how they're running it and not not chasing. It's not a chasing job. So that that's the other that's the one message. The other message is just to alert the board that we went out to tender for our new uh, external auditor. Uh, we did not receive any bids. Um, the market is a mess uh, between Simon and I. We've spoken to every firm, every regulator, every big body boss in the world that we know of. I've even twisted friends. Um, all of them are saying there's no capacity in the system uh, to take on any audits right now. The market is a mess. There have been levers. They're choosing internal audit over external audit. We are in discussion with NHSEI about what to do. They may name us an auditor uh, or we are also asking for an extension because, of course, now it's getting late. So just to let you know, we have it in hand. We are not dropping the ball. Um, we just unfortunately have failed to uh, excite the market enough to come to ASPH right now. We'll let you know as soon as we have an answer. So that's all I'd like to say, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Marcin. And that will be an important message, obviously, for the Council of Governors when we meet next week as well, because uh, the, they get to choose the external orders, don't they? They don't get to choose, they get to a point. But yes, yes to a thanks. point, yes. I'm just, yeah, officially. Point on our recommendation, yes. Yes, with their involvement. Indeed. Right, Suzanne. Yeah, thank you, Marcin. Um, I'm just reflecting on your sort of reflection back to us around the risk management strategy, and you know, I'll, we will take that away and have that conversation. Um, I mean, I know that David and Andrea chair the risk and safety committee, and I can tell you from I don't always go, but I I'm often sat quite close to them when they're chairing, and there is it's quite a high energy conversation. So I do wonder if it's about capacity. So I don't think there's any lack of intellectual engagement but maybe i'm overstating it um but 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 it's possible it's probably capacity so uh i'll check with them and see, see but you're right it's a good tech conversation so we'll do that thank you thank you suzanne okay and thank you marcin for that um we're then going to move to the review of scheme of delegation uh, and standing financial instructions. Merrick, has this been through modern healthcare? Uh, yes, it has. And uh, it's been through the audit committee. And it's been through, yes, that was, you took the words right out of my mouth. Marcel. Sorry, you just know how excited I am about my new committee. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, it got, got me quoting meatloaf now. Um, so, yes, so, and it's been through the audit committee. So, any, either of you want to raise anything? No. Both happy with these. Okay, so in which case? Oh, sorry, I, sorry. Yes, Suzanne. Sorry. Well, we were happy to sign them off, but I think there is a quite a bit of work to do for the chief executive and team around the elements that describe where different cases go to the, before they come for decision. So there's work to be done there. Um, just, yeah. just so that everybody's aware that you know. So it wasn't a matter of just that looks fine. We thought it looks fine for now. Well, it's it's a description of what is in some ways, other than the changes yeah. that are detailed. But but work to do. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, Simon. Anything to add? No, I think there's a range of other minor tweaks and amendments, and keep them aligned with national arrangements. So they're relatively straightforward, to be honest, Andy. Okay. Uh, there was something I had. Yes, it was just around the seal. And, and it was an observation because it, it says 
authorise use of the seal, but we always seem to authorise it in retrospect. Uh, well, we'd always have a business case or other reason um, to to be undertaking, you know, a contract. And if that makes sense, you all sign things off in advance. The seal is the kind of formal element of of that, really. So, in, in giving approval to business cases within a month or two, we'll be putting in place the contracts that that back those up. So, so in that sense, it's not retrospective. But because the seal is a very formal tool and has got specific status in our in our candidates in our standing orders that we're required to tell you every time we've used it yes. uh, so it's just I don't think it's unusual that process but it is quite a formal part of of the scheme of delegation and it's a very formal yeah. tool it's why we keep it locked away and hidden yes. from, <laughs> from everyone I don't know where it is <laughs> including the execs <laughs> so keep it away from Suzanne yeah um I uh, no I wasn't objecting to the uh, yeah, that's a good question. The wording could be tweaked on that one because when you read it cold, it says authorised use of the seal. That to me means before you use the seal, you need to be signed off. And if it said something else like, you know, uh, done in retrospect as business cases will. I mean, maybe we can put it in the business cases themselves that it's, uh, yes. you know, in the way we close those off, we could include wording that. That authorise that, um, you know, the use of the seal on a future basis. Yeah, yeah, agreed. It often can happen quite a, a lot of months later, depending yes. on the complexity of the schemes and and other and other kind of factors. So there's there's always a a time delay, and I, I think you'll probably sometimes look at a uh, look at the use of a seal and and try and think back to exactly when that was approved, because it could be three or four months earlier, for example. Yes, and of course it might be to do with part of a business case as well. Not yeah, not exactly, exactly. Yeah, so we don't want to put any extra burdens or, or, or hurdles just to make it clear in the instructions room. Yeah, OK, understood. OK, great. Um, anybody? David? Well, I, th I think it's I think Andy, it's in line with what Suzanne was saying, that we just need to get clarity on all the processes that lead to the point when you're actually going to sign the check, as it were. Um, and they, they've got to be visible. So when you're at that stage, there's visibility of the yeah. piece process to make sure the preceding process has been achieved and that's that's all part of the same thing yeah yes yeah. agreed david thank you okay so we'll now move on to the register of interests we can see the register of interests there they are obviously published as well on our website um if anybody's got any additions to what is written there or it's not accurate then please do let uh, Liz and Sal know uh, because we need to keep this as up to date as we possibly can uh, from a register of interest point of view. Um, that is just to receive today. Uh, David. So, so, so Andy, I was, I was looking through the register of interest and I just wondered whether some guidance, so some people have got some roles in the ICS or, or wherever, and I just, I think there just needs to be Possibly a little bit of. Um, I, I didn't know whether people were were registering things differently to other people. Um, yeah, I mean, traditionally, registers of interest are around kind of outside interests, aren't they? Yeah. Um, yeah. They're, they're about you know the fact that that I'm a non-executive with Think or something, and we yeah. might be looking at them. Um, yeah. Whereas inside there, but then there are you know we couldn't say don't register health service because obviously Fran and I are, uh, are directors of CSH. So, yeah, yeah. so, so where it's a, it's a little bit gray, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, perhaps where we, where it is a formal paid different appointment, mm. then it should be registered, definitely should be registered. But may, where, where you're just acting, you know, you're still chief executive, but actually you're chairing the people collaborative or BSPS at the moment. I'm not sure that is a, yeah, registrable yeah. thing. Well, that's Suzanne, I just, what do you think? I mean, I, 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 I've come to the view, and maybe this is wrong, that twofold really, where wherever you might have the opportunity to use your influence to benefit the organisation in which you're sitting or you're mm. representing or you're a member of, but you're doing another role, then 
wise to declare the interest. So I'm sitting here thinking, I wonder if I ought to declare that I'm a designate to another big NHS organisation. Yes, yes. For example, um, because I could I could potentially leverage that, I suppose. Um, and also having been through some of the challenge that we've been through with these things in the past with um, members of the public sort of saying it's not all clear. I just think for complete transparency, I didn't see any harm in listing them. So that 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 was my thought. Uh, the, 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 point, the point I was making, Andy, was that I don't think anyone's done anything wrong. I just think there's a difference. And I suppose yeah. Yeah, it, it's roles like I saw Simon declare his role as Sira across which I think is absolutely right. But within the ICS, there are these roles now. So people have chairmanship over uh, yes. over a bigger footprint. And I, it, it, it was just, I didn't know what was right or wrong and everything, but I just think it's just getting a bit more complicated, I think, that, that whereas yeah, people it used to be a separate company or something like that, it's now a little bit more complicated. And it's going to get more so, I think. <laughs> Simon? I was just going to say, maybe we could flesh out the, the reasons a little bit better. So using mine as the example, um, then I'm actually committing millions on behalf of that wider place-based system. And that's why I feel very strongly that I should declare mm. that as a as an interest in all those kind of ways. Um, equally with East Ken, and this is a fairly amusing sort of one, but we do behind the scenes fraud checks and other kind of things. And if you're directors in two very different organisations, then they often want to know why at the centre. So I declare that one specifically because otherwise I'd be in trouble with some of these yeah. uh, other, other kind of national things. So there's there's a range of factors that are coming out now, and I, I think maybe it would help everyone just to be very clear on 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 those and and interests and what you shouldn't and and, and shouldn't yep. be declaring, Andy. So, but um, but yeah, they're they're good examples where you know you could probably argue slightly differently, but you know it's as Suzanne said, you better be transparent and open and declaring these. So everyone knows. I mean, at the moment, it's always easier to declare than not declare. You know, you can't exactly. be wrong by declaring, can you? Exactly. Uh, Martine. Just to say the Cabinet Office has guidance that spe specifies exactly. And exactly. Influence, influence is a definite one. So perhaps what we ought to do is, Sal, to circulate the Cabinet Office's guidance on what, what considers a board registered of interest. That will clarify it for everyone, and it's really simple to listen to and read. Okay, okay, good good advice. Yeah. And then once you've done that, um, Sal, is Sal on? Yes. Um, then perhaps Sal and I will have a conversation about it as well. Okay, good. Um, any other business? I haven't had anything declared to me. Not seeing anything. No. Um, this, oh, Chris. Sorry, Andy, I, I don't know whether you mentioned it before. I just noticed on Twitter yesterday, uh, Claire Fuller's announcement. Yes, so it has been announced that uh, Claire Fuller is now the chief executive designate of the Integrated Care Board, as Ian Smith is the chair designate of the Integrated Care Board, and they will come in, their new roles will come into being if and when the, uh, we, which we hope is when, of course, uh, the <laughs> legislation is passed. Um, which is currently due for the beginning of April. So, yeah, thank you for that, Chris. Good point. Um, and, we, and we welcome that appointment because um, we, we've worked with Claire for uh, a long time now and uh, we're really pleased she's got that appointment. So, there's any questions from the public that have been logged? Uh, no questions this time from the public. Not okay. even late questions from the public. Right, okay. Um, right, so any reflections on today's meeting? It's been a lot of papers. I was very aware that there were a lot of papers, by the way. Sal and I were kind of agonising about part of the thing, though, about reducing the number of board meetings, of course, is there are numbers of these papers that have to come. Um, and therefore, we, we did move one or two things uh, to the next meeting. Um, but it's uh, it's quite a burden, as Chris Chris Kane said earlier. You know, the this is why we formed the Strategic Change Committee so that we can have time to think away from all the uh, all the necessary assurance things that we do. Um, David, 
I, just my reflection was I thought the um, the patient story was absolutely fabulous. That was the highlight. Today, yes. I'd say. Um, and it just cut across so many things. Absolutely. And uh, she's she's just so on it, wasn't she? She really, really uh, hats off to her what, what she is doing, actually. Uh, amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Good. OK, so it is we are four minutes over, for which I apologise. Um, and I think we have got one more task to do, but it's on a separate link uh, because we have to meet as corporate trustee to look at the uh, accounts for the charitable fund. So if we can do that at 1340 and hopefully move fairly swiftly through that, then that would be helpful. But thank you. I want to close the board meeting at this point. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, governors uh, or any other members of the public that have joined us. Uh, always welcome. And um, we'll see you soon. Thank, thank you, Andy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye.